Hi everyone. Welcome to our Bay Nature Talk titled A Year with the Urban Gray Fox. I'm Taylor Crisalgo, Development Manager at Bay Nature, and I am so grateful you could join us today. Bay Nature Magazine has been connecting people in the Bay Area to local nature for over 21 years. We are a nonprofit that tells the stories of local nature through a quarterly print magazine and online articles. This is part uh, talk is part of our ongoing Bay Nature Talk series. And tonight's webinar is based on the fox guy, Bill Leakham, who is featured in our winter 2022 story, How to Be a Fox. Before we begin, a little housekeeping. If you have any technical difficulties, please let, know that this webinar is being recorded and the link will be sent to you, along with links to resources. If you have any questions during Bill's talk, please enter them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of them as we can after the presentation. We'd like to thank the David Brower Center in Berkeley for providing our technical support this evening. We'd also like to thank everyone who registered for the talk and a special thank you to those of you who made the suggested donation for tonight. Your support helps Bay Nature bring you these talks. Tonight's speaker is Bill Leakham, who for 12 years has been doing unprecedented work documenting, photographing, and researching the behavior of the gray fox. His research resulted in the development of the Urban Wildlife Research Project, which is dedicated to developing viable habitat and connectivity corridors for wildlife at the Palo Alto Baylands. He also has a new book that was just released titled The Road to Fox Hollow. Links for where to purchase his book are now in the chat. And with that, Bill, please take it away. Let's go. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, it's afternoon over here, and uh, so we, let's uh, take a little journey uh, with the gray fox. And so this is a year with the gray fox. We're going to cover a whole year of development in a very short period of time. This is an ethological approach to the gray fox. Ethology, the science, the scientific study of animal behavior, usually with a focus on behavior under natural conditions. And that means that I go out twice a day to document the gray foxes one time really early in the morning. And then uh, I watch and I jot down notes on what they're doing and uh, take that back and put it into my log. Then in the afternoon, that's kind of maintenance, but also uh, on occasion, you'll see the gray foxes uh, out and about because they are what we call crepuscular. And that is uh, this term down here. They're active at dawn and dusk, and sometimes in the middle of the day too, because they have multiple places where they like to go nap. And when they do, you can sometimes catch them going from one area to the next area. All right, so a little bit of background now so that we can get a picture of this uh, little critter. And uh, then we'll plunge into the, their lives. So, Urban versus wild. Urban gray foxes are more accustomed to uh, living in and around uh, people. Okay. The area that I study is right on the border between the urban areas and the wild areas. A fox is truly out there in the wild is not going to usually be seen. They know that you're coming along the trail, let's say for instance, long before you ever know that they're anywhere nearby. 
And what they do is they duck off into the brush and they're usually sitting there watching you pass by on the trail. And when you're adequately distant from them, they resume their lives. Now people get gray foxes and red foxes all mixed up, okay? But it's simple. The tail colors, a gray fox has a black tip on its tail. And you can see that from some distance away. A red fox has a white tip on its tail. And you could, uh, red foxes uh, are sometimes um, not just red, they, they range in color from nearly black to white. Nonetheless, that white tip on the tail is always there, no matter what color their skin, uh, their, their fur is. Now over the nomenclature, uh, baby, baby foxes, uh, lots of people call them kits. Over in England, they call them cubs. And I call them pups because they're canines. They're puppies when they're small. And let's go to monogamous. Not always the case. I have seen a gray fox divorce. And I may talk about that a little bit more later on down the line. Uh, the cultural reputation that River and Blackfeet tribes uh, hold the fox in high, high esteem. They are gods. And then you have Aesop's fables from about 2000 years ago. For instance, the fox and the crow. Old fox is coming along the trail. He hasn't had a bite to eat for a long time. And overhead comes crow flying in with a big chunk of cheese in its beak. And it lands in the tree nearby fox and fox sees it up there. And thinks, whoa, that piece of cheese, it sure tastes good. Whoa. And so fox says, Miss Crow, Mr. Crow, Hey, up there, you got the most beautiful voice in the whole universe. I would, I would love to have you sing for me. And the crow is baffled because nobody has ever told him that before. And Fox continues and says, please, please, Mr. Crow, please sing your song for me so that I may leave here satisfied. Oh, Crow, Crow is getting, uh, he says, whoa, this guy's real. He really doesn't want to see or hear my song. And so he opens his beak, cheese falls to the ground. Fox runs over, picks it up, looks up at Crow and says, beware of those who flatter you. The gray fox is the oldest of all the foxes. As you can read there, they're the evolutionarily basal canid. That means they're down here at the bottom. They're, they're down in here. And all the rest of the canines evolve later. The gray fox is between eight and 12 million years old. I just like to cut that in half and say, well, let's just use 10 million as a standard. And so if they're 10 million years old, they cannot reproduce with any other canine whatsoever. And so what you're genetically looking at, if you see a gray fox, 
live out there in the brush or nearby or on a trail somewhere, you're looking at a genetic replica of a 10 million year old fox. Genetically speaking, it runs straight back 10 million years. That's how old they are. And their range, as you can see here, that white, the, the white area up in here, I've tried to find out why those gray foxes are not up in this area at all. I've contacted scientists at the University of uh, Montana and Idaho, and no one knows why these uh, empty, there's these empty spaces in here. And then you go down into uh, Central America and there's uh, some little small places in Central America where they're not to be found and no one knows the reason why. But they go all the way down into Venezuela and, and Colombia, the northern parts of those two countries. And they're found there. So they have a very, very, very broad range that they uh, uh, inhabit. Now, behaviors. This submissive happiness is very, very important. This tail swishing, ears flat back. You can see this, the, the image in this, this little fox here. Precisely, that little fox is in submissive uh, behavior mode to this other fox, which may be a, an alpha, male, female, depending. And so the tail swishing indicates happiness. Ears back means submission. Body motion, belly low, squeaking chirps. Toward the, toward the end of our presentation here, we will be able to witness this. And then there's the fox kiss. When I first started studying these, uh, these uh, gray foxes, this was one of the first behaviors that I saw consistently over time. And uh, so it's, as you can read there, it's uh, between pup and adult mate to mate, or when greeting an alpha fox. And here in this little video over here on the side, we're gonna see an effusive young pup coming to visit his father. That male right there is dark. That's his father. And he's the alpha male of the region. So let's watch, see what happens. And here he comes. Look at that. 7 fun with dad. And dad is trying to groom him. <laughs> Another piece of the gray fox behavior is ear cleaning. During certain times of the year, uh, they, get, uh, they get vermin clogged in their ears because it's a nice warm place to be. For that vermin. But for the gray fox, it's a detriment because in the end, hearing is their primary um, way of um, moving through, the, through their world. Okay. Eyesight is third on the list. There's hearing is first, second is smell, third is visual. And so this is what ear cleaning looks like typically. Here we go. That's mom, that's cute. And she's uh, <clears throat> gobbling up the vermin in um, midget's uh, ear, ears, plural. 
And that behavior is pretty standard. And now most people have never heard a gray fox quote bark. It's not a bark at all. Let's listen to it. You hear that little whistle at the end there? That's pretty much 100% of the time that little whistle follows a bark. And now, back to hearing, talk, they're, they're, they're hearing their ears, okay? When we run this video that I'm gonna show you here, that's a red fox, by the way, I couldn't get a, a decent one for the gray fox. But when you see this, think about the following. Under the snow, four feet below, runs a little a mouse, a rodent, okay? It's moving at a given speed under four feet of snow. This fox, in order to catch that uh, rodent, must be able to anticipate where that rodent is going to be in the time it takes to leap and catch that mouse. The calculations that must go on in that brain of his are incredible. Mathematically, they take you into upper reaches of math. So let's watch this for a moment, okay? It listens for the tiny sounds of its prey moving about below, but must take great care not to scare them away. See, he's calculating, moving his head, moving those ears. He comes back with the rodent in his mouth. That's one of the most incredible. And I've seen gray foxes that have done the same kind of high leap coming down into tall grass and coming out with a rodent. Their basic food diet is on the West Coast here is uh, uh, our rodents. Okay, late November and February to February, the single foxes are pairing up. They bark and especially at, at night, if you live in an area where there are lots of gray foxes, you're gonna, you're gonna hear barking. And that's, hey, come on, I'm available over here. And then once, once the, uh, so here's, here's what I saw, okay. There was mama bold, well, she wasn't a mama by then, she was just looking for a mate. And uh, she uh, let about three or four young, um, males go by. They'd stay for a day or two and then she would probably, I'm guessing, would kick them out and send them on their way until this male gray showed up. I'll say more about him later. Okay, um, they are at this point, they, they are monogamous and polyandrous. And as you read there, the, the mating of one female with more than one male, while each male mates only with one female, and that's known as polyandry. That's the way they are. And so a, a female, when she gets pregnant, she can be carrying the genetic signature of more than one male. 
and so th that's their that's their overall <clears throat> uh, mating methods. Okay, but be, uh, while they're doing this, once the once the uh, pair has uh, paired up, that becomes a period of real tenderness and relating and playing and they they just have a a lot of fun until those pups are born and so here's the alpha male and cute And these were all stills and I had to put them together like this, but it shows a real tenderness by these foxes. Look, she's got her ears back. See that? Look at that. It's so incredibly fine. And especially for these two foxes because they didn't maintain that tender uh, being with one another as they got older. April through September, growing up, the fox pups, boy, they grow up quick. Whenever I've been in the field and I've seen the pups come from the uh, brush with usually one of the adults, um, and they are born just as little balls of fur but dark, uh, usually it's dark, uh, dark, dark gray uh, color, coloration. Anyway, um, I know that I have to get onto it because it, within weeks, they'll start to change color until at about six, eight, 10 weeks or so, they're taking on full color of their parents. And by the time they're ready to disperse, that you can't tell the difference. But here in this first video up uh, here, we have Mama Bold, probably the only video that I know of, of a gray fox in labor. And then tagged on with that, Den Moving Day. Den Moving Day, day is when Mama Bold decided the natal den where they were, the pups were born was not going to uh, be good enough for them. They had, they had to move uh, the, the whole den to somewhere new. And these, the, the, the pups had never left that den before, okay? And, beca and because of that, well, we'll see what they do. Listen very carefully. That's Mama Bold, and she's about ready to have pups. And now she's moving them. This was about 16, 18 days later, okay? And she's carrying them just like a cat would carry a kitten, okay? And she's got a new place that she's staked out. And there she goes again with another pup. She's taking them over to the... And these foxes, they, they cash, cash their food, any extra food they don't just leave it out in the open for other critters to come by and devour. No, 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 no. They cache their food. And when need be, they dig it up and they eat. And one time I saw this happening and the meat seemed to be covered with a jelly-like substance. And I don't know what that indicates. Um, I've never seen them uh, take cash out 
of uh, its uh, place since then, except on uh, trail cameras like this. So she's had a little snack and she's gonna take the cash off to where the new den is. The new den is about 150 yards from where the natal den was. So here she is again, <clears throat> she's got two more and she's been at this all day. So I think she's trying to get them to walk to the new den, but remember they've never left the natal den. They don't, they don't know what that big world is out there. Oh, and this little one decides that he's not gonna go willingly to this new place. He's gonna stay and he goes over and gets his sibling and says, come on, come on, let's go back home. Well, home's over here, not over there. And so Mama Bold has got to come, after, uh, come back and pick them up one by one and carry them off to the new den. That's a lot of work. And I, I, I wondered when I first got this, hold on. A little bit of play and a little bit of curiosity. And that's Mama Bold. And so, Let's take a look here at these other, that's gray. And here come the pups. See how dark they are, this, the, 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 the fur? Well, that fur is gonna change awfully quick. Gray was a very, very fine uh, father to his pups. And so was M Mama Bo. Uh, they, they, they both were really good, good parents. And I could contrast that with some of the other fox pairs that were not so, were not so uh, good. All right, every once in a while, they're in their territory, okay? And for the, for the pups, they sometimes come upon another critter that they may not have ever seen before. And so here's one instance of that. Come on. That little pup has seen something out there. Oh, it's a skunk. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and skunk comes up. Whoa, no, wait a minute. Wait. Gray foxes have a curiosity factor that is high, really high. And skunk decides he's going to leave these little foxes alone. But they're, as I said, their curiosity factor is huge. And here's mama nursing. Sometimes as they get older and older, um, there's no room to adequately nurse. And so that little one's trying to find a way in. Probably push that one out and that one just decides, okay, all right, all right. I had a little bit and he goes over there. And Here's uh, some, um, gray, was, gray was a master hunter. Okay, that's all I can say. He caught more than he, he, he missed. And here's a little bit of that kind of behavior, bringing, bringing in the rodent for his pups. He whistles, whistles for them.
Oops. Uh, I wanted to point this out. The Canada goose here in the corner that uh, uh, he brought in, I saw that uh, happening. And um, I want to say this, G Gray, Gray would walk about maybe, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 feet or so, drop the goose, pant, pick the, pe pick the goose up again, take it another 10 or 15, 20 feet, drop it, pant, and so forth, all the way back to his, his pups. And uh, I got the pictures. I followed him all the way to where the pups were uh, taking photographs of that uh, instance. Now, over here, cute hunts a tree squirrel. I was coming into this area uh, um, to take a look at and my take a look at my trail cameras, and I looked behind me, and there's cute following me. Okay, so we get into this big clearing area where there's very little brush and so forth. And I had a trail camera sitting there. I went over to the trail camera. Cute dashes back into the bushes. And I thought, ah, OK. And I'm working with my trail camera, right? And oh, I look up. And there is Cute up in that tree. I knew instantly what she was doing up there. She was hunting, of course. Now, gray foxes are the only ones that can uh, foxes that can climb trees. And they uh, will see some of that climbing action in the next slide. But here is what she does. Come on, there we go. Sorry, it's a little bit rough and out of focus a little bit, but it was hard holding that camera to do this video. Now cute, I think she knows where that, it's a squirrel. She goes up, look down, back down. There goes that squirrel. Oh, she fell into the thicket down below. And that little squirrel is probably the happiest little squirrel on the planet. Uh, just simply because look at look at how it's ooh, ooh. yeah that's got to be a happy uh, little squirrel. Now over here in the story of daring in the high speed climbing school, uh, daring was uh, the alpha pup of the of the uh, uh, of, of the litter. She controlled the rest of her siblings by fighting. One day, I don't, I think it was probably an adult fought her and injured her so badly that she couldn't climb the tree. She couldn't join her siblings in the high speed climbing that Gray was teaching his uh, pups. And so here they are. Up in the up in the tree, they're taking a little break here. I, I couldn't get all of the uh, high speed climbing. Here comes another one. There's three. There's two more somewhere. And down at the base, there's Daring. She's trying to climb with them, but her hind leg is injured so badly, and her ear look her ear is flopped over, and she she is seriously handicapped, very seriously handicapped, because in order to escape a predator, she'd have to be able to climb a tree. She can't climb a tree to escape a predator, therefore she's vulnerable. Her hearing is impaired. And here we see mama coming over and There's nothing mama can do. Now the hierarchy. Eventually, 
all the pups fall uh, develop a hierarchy, but it's not innate. It's learned through fighting over food. Let's see one of those fights. There we go. Everybody tries to, to get at that. I think it's a little rabbit. But the strongest two will conquer and, and get the food. There they go. There we go. See, tug of war now. All right, all right. And uh, eventually one of them gets most of the food, second one gets second most, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through. And now over here in this other slide, Tense has a, a disagreement with Cute. Here is a typical fox fight. They never last for very long. A little tense. She knows. She knows she's been put in her place. The story of Pale and Blackie. I wish I could. I wish I had the time to tell you the full story of this little male down here in down here. Uh, called Blackie, uh, because he's an in one incredible little fox. I'm going to have to write a story just about Blackie. Okay, I haven't done that yet. Uh, but the story, Pale, Pale uh, was a bold and, and gray's um, pup, and she dispersed. She left, and uh, she left home and uh, took over a parking lot. Okay, and there's high tech stuff right next door to him. Well, that didn't suit her, so she came back home to mama and to dad, Gray. And this is her return. They're grooming mom. And Gray goes off into the weeds out there. And Pale and Mama, they, those two had a very interesting um, friendship. Although it was mom and daughter, it did, it, it did, did become a friendship. And so um, Pale hung around there for quite a while, maybe, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing now about a month, and Blackie shows up. She teams up with Blackie, but Mama Bold and uh, Gray don't like this teaming, this team that she's put together. So what happens is that, um, um, Dark, no, not dark, gray, gray, excuse me. Gray um, forces them to leave the uh, area, their, uh, her, uh, the home range. And he chases Blackie out. And in so doing, Pale follows Blackie. And they go over to the other side of the water treatment plant and take up home there. And mama comes over there every once in a while and pays them a visit. Pay a grade never does. But this is dispersal, okay, um, where they have to leave home. If, if they don't, it's oftentimes the alpha male of the region that will chase, fight, make the young ones leave, and go find their own mate, their own territory, and raise their own family. 
And so it's an epilogue by Squat the Elder. Squat was uh, uh, Mama Bold's dad, he was the male. And he taught me the foundation of everything that I came to learn to what it meant to be a gray fox. But Squat the Elder says, science has clearly shown that we gray foxes and other animals that inhabit the night are not just hardwired critters running through the thickets on what you humans call instinct. We are sentient beings, thinking, feeling, conscious. We anticipate the future. We think similar to you. We show affection for one another. We are sometimes jealous because one pup has more attention given. There are times when we are happy while at other times we mourn our loss. Because we are in such close proximity to you, we lose our food supply and our homes because many of you, fellow, your fellow human beings, fail to understand our needs and our lives. Instead of destroying our habitats, our corridors, our ancient natal dens, please help to preserve these regions and treat us with respect. In turn, we will be a boon to the ecosystem as we work to keep it healthy for both humans and wildlife alike. Respectfully, Squat the Elder. Thank you. And for more information, you can go to our website, urbanwildliferesearchproject.com. And uh, we need to refurbish that website, but we're working on it. Okay. And you can donate if you wish. We could sure use it for that restoration project. Okay, thank you for attending and coming in and I hope you enjoyed something and you have something you can take away. Bill, thank you so much. That was incredible. And I love how your presentation had so many videos because I feel like a gray fox is an animal that I rarely get to see, much less be a part of their, their lives in this way. So Bill, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, it was just, it was a pleasure being here with you today. And with that, uh, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A coming through. Um, we only have about 15 minutes to answer all of the questions here. So we might only be able to get to a couple of them, but um, yeah, I guess I'll start with this one. So it's really interesting timing too, Bill, that you know we're hosting this webinar um, around the same time that something interesting is being reported out in the Bay. I think you and I had spoken about it briefly, but uh, Bay Nature had recently just reported on a possible outbreak of canine distemper in the area. Um, and Bill, I know your fox population had also been affected by it in 2016. So I was wondering if you could, you know, kind of speak more about that. Well, uh, yeah, the, we we had a die out um, at uh, in 2016. Uh, we had, uh, or I was monitoring um, roughly 25 uh, gray foxes. I uh, didn't focus on all of those 25, but they were there and uh, I came to get to know them. By the way, I wanted to mention this. I, uh, when I first started this whole uh, project, I had no idea what a gray fox was. I knew nothing. And now I think I know a little bit. I think. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, so the uh, summer of 2016 was burning hot. It was a hot summer. And uh, long about uh, November, we start getting, we start getting uh, reports of dead gray foxes around the area and animal services was picking them up. And so I got notified uh, right away uh, that uh, this was happening. And in November and December of uh, 2016, all 25 of the foxes succumbed to canine distemper. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that left me with a great big emptiness. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't have any more foxes in the area to, to uh, interact with and, and to document and to monitor. I waited two years and one month every day doing the same thing that I did, did when the foxes were there, knowing that they would, that another pair of foxes or a group of foxes would come in and inhabit one of the areas. And so I waited and waited and waited. And when they, when they showed up, when this pair showed up, that's one of them behind me there. That's, that's limos, means long neck. And uh, in Greek, by the way. And, and so uh, in 2016, they, um, where was I? I I'd lost that thought. Anyway, anyway, they all died out and oh, oh, oh. And, and when I first saw them on the uh, trail camera, I just sat here and said, yes, yes, they're back. What a day, what a morning that was. I bet, okay. I mean, especially after two years too. And so we've got a 2016 outbreak too. How is the population doing today? Has it since grown back to the, the same numbers that you saw before? Not, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Limos and, and his mate, Big Eyes, um, she, she and he uh, encountered a trespasser into their territory uh, back about four months or so after they came into the area. And uh, they fought her. We called, it, we called that little fox flop because it had a floppy ear, okay? And um, um, they fought her and fought her and fought her and drove her out, okay? And no, none of, no other foxes have come into the, into the territory. I think they eventually will. I think these two foxes will give room, but not right now. So I only have two foxes that I'm uh, monitoring. Wow, and now that's such a change just from that event in 2016. Wow, and so I mean, the other animals that you're monitoring too, are you seeing any, any signs of canine distemper or anything that, that could? you know, be anything going on? Well, um, raccoons can get uh, canine distemper. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found two suspects uh, uh, about two weeks ago. I guess it's yeah, about two weeks ago now. And uh, so um, I'm keeping an eye out for any other um, dead uh, raccoons in, in the area. It, it, it could affect these two foxes as well, because there are raccoons living right next door, right in the same vicinity as these foxes. I hope not, but <clears throat> I always have to be ready for anything. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you for sharing more about, you know, what's going on um, and kind of switching gears here too. So I'd love for you to share how you first came across a fox at the Palo Alto Bay Land. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's I, I used to live in the fox. I love that stretch of trail. But I have to tell you, I I've never seen a fox and now I really want to. So can you tell us a little <laughs> more about how you found one? Yeah, well, um I I was actually uh birding, okay. I was, I was photographing birds and uh, I trespassed on the Palo Alto um, city property into a construction area I shouldn't have been in, but I, but I snuck my way through and into this, uh, on this uh, little old dirt road. And I came around a turn in the, in the road and I was looking kind of through some brush. And I looked down toward this steel gate that was down there on that road. On the other side of that was a little gray fox sitting beside the brush. I hadn't seen a gray fox since I was a kid. And so my camera is going, bam, click, 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 and I'm walking closer and closer and closer to that 
little gray fox and I get all the way to the gate, okay? And I'm up there at the gate and I'm and that fox is still sitting there about, mm, I don't know, 20 feet away from me. And uh, I thought, oh my God, does that fox have rabies or something? You know, something wrong. That shouldn't be the way it's, so it should be in the brush or wherever, run away, you know? It didn't. I went around the gate and just as I got around to looking straight at this uh, little fox, it calmly stood up and walked right back into the brush. And that was, that was my introduction. That was my, my uh, yeah, I don't know how else to put that. That was my introduction. And they hooked me. Three days later, I found out there was a family in there. And so I, I don't know, I just started jotting down on a piece of, on a post-it um, notes about what they were doing. And that blossomed into something more and more and more. It, 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 this whole thing just has grown organically from that event back then, 2009. And Bill, I love that. I mean, that just shows us the power of local nature too. I mean, your story really embodies that. You know, the minute you start paying attention and looking at things a little closer and, you know, luckily you had your notepad, it's just, it's amazing what can become of it, so. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, mo a lot of people uh, hold uh, stereotypes of these uh, of the wildlife that's around um and uh if you do just like you said if you look closer and more consistently and watch what they're doing that doing is essential watch what they're doing you'll get you'll soon get another whole view of what wildlife is they all have personalities that's why I couldn't call them by their scientific name because the personalities and the, oh, I don't know, gray was more gray than any of the other foxes. And uh, Mama Bold was strong. She, she, was, she was a strong little fox. She fought her father and took over his territory. Her father squat, okay? He, she, I was, I was on the road at the moment that that fight took place. And when it was all, over, all said and done, I looked back to where Squat had been. I never saw the little fox again. And she took over, hitched up with Gray, and all else is history. <laughs> all else is history. Well, Bell, it's just... Thank you so much for coming on for this webinar and just- I really, enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, we got so many fantastic questions, everyone. And I'm so sorry that we can't answer them all um, just because we'll need to wrap things up. And I wanted to t at least have a little more time too to remind everyone to please check out Bill's book, The Road to Fox Hollow. Also great timing because it recently came out, right, Bill? Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Uh, it's now available to buy. We're putting some links in the chat um, so that you can learn more about Bill and his work with these amazing boxes. Um, also in the chat, we're putting a link to check out Bill's ongoing work with the Urban Wildlife Research Project. Um, so please make sure to take time and check out both of those. And uh, lastly, keep an eye out for news about our next Bay Nature Talk too. Um, I believe it's happening towards the end of April um, and it'll be on Paleo Valley. Um, but with that, you know, I just, I wanted to close just by saying thank you so much to everyone and Bill any last words too in our last couple of minutes well I I don't I don't know I, I'm really honored that you asked me to come here and to um, make this uh, presentation I've always respected Bay Nature as a publication a highly respected publication and you guys do a absolutely spectacular job over there so thank you again. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for taking us into the lives of these gray foxes. It's 
it's really cool. And I'm going to go down to the Palo Alto Baylands now, and I'm going to bring my binoculars and keep an eye out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in any case, you know, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Wishing you a wonderful evening, and thank you again so much to the Bar Center, and thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Good night, everyone.